You may be seated. I'd like to call on the ushers for it this time. We'll wait upon the Lord for morning tithe and offering. There is a missionary as they come. There's a missionary in our past from our movement, uh, John Bichel, that uh, was a missionary to Hong Kong. There was a particular property in Hong Kong that was worth millions of dollars. He wanted to buy that property, procure it, turn it into a missions camp so that young people could come and get saved, hear about Jesus, encounter his spirit, and get saved. He uh, itinerated in the United States for a couple of years to raise the money. He went back to Hong Kong. He was not able to raise that money. He did not have enough. He was discouraged. He was despondent. He was beside himself. What am I going to do next? And uh, so what he did was, is he went back to Hong Kong in faith, and a little girl back in the United States had sent him a letter, and in that letter was a $1 bill. Now, you might be saying this morning, big deal. But that's what he got. He took the $1 bill. He went back to the people that was selling the property. They were now bankrupt. The people that were selling the property went ahead and sold it to that man for $1. Now, the point this morning is, is some of you are in this dichotomy about giving. You're, you're thinking that, what you have to give is not enough, so don't give it at all. And what I want to tell you this morning is, is that God doesn't need your money. God wants you to display your faith. Even if it's a dollar bill, it's 50 cents, it's a quarter. Whatever it is, God wants to take that so that the story of his power is released. It's not a financial power, it's a faith power. And that's what happened in that story. I want to encourage you today. Whatever God places on your heart to give, give as unto the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of giving. We thank you that, God, we give like Jesus because we want to be like Jesus. We don't give to know Jesus. <laughs> All we need to do is receive the gift to know Jesus. We give because we want to be like him. We give you the praise and the thanks and the glory to be cheerful givers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Praise the Lord. I know in your bulletins it has a different text. God changed that on me this morning. We're still in the same sermon series, but God gave me a different direction. How many of you know that's okay? All right, so Acts chapter 19, verse 1. We're going to begin a series here on friendship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I hope that you will learn something about the most precious, the most important the most valuable relationship you will ever have in your life. The most valuable and powerful relationship you will ever have in your life is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a relationship with the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? So let's go ahead and read in Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the interior and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Are there any disciples in this room this morning? Yes. Okay. Okay, so if you're a believer, you're a disciple. Disciple means disciplined one. It means follower of Christ. Are there any followers of Christ in this room this morning? Yes. Okay, so I guess I'm not alone. Good. So he found some disciples. He found them 
on 124 Ash. He found him on Prospect Avenue. And right there, verse 2. And he asked him, Do you re have you or did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? <laughs> oh, no, no, you just, want, you just want to nod this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? Yes. It's okay. The answer in the text is no. <laughs> they were honest. I'm not sure we are. I'm not sure we are. You see, they were disciples, they were followers of Christ, they were disciplined in the Word, they had heard about Christ, they had given their lives to Christ. They had no relationship, they didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. They had no idea what Paul was talking about. They said, no, they answered, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I wonder if Paul walked into our church this morning this place that God, we gather together in to be a body of Christ, to worship you and to love you and to praise you. Would someone like Paul walk through these doors and know anybody that knows your spirit? God, help us to understand this morning that knowledge about your spirit is not knowing your spirit. God, help us to understand the finer distinguishment here god to know your spirit goes beyond knowledge of your spirit we ask this in jesus name amen amen i just want to i want to ask you I, I don't know if uh if if all of you are married um if you are married congratulations uh the bible says uh, he that's found a wife has found a good thing uh you want to line your life up with agreement in the word of god don't you yeah, yeah okay three women fantastic we're, we're this plane is flying this morning man oh he did say yeah i just couldn't hear him over the women okay <laughs> all right good 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 all right so if uh if you can go back a little bit and if any of you have ever dated someone before um and uh you can remember that experience uh you know that probably red flags go up when you sit down at a date you start to have a conversation at the at, on the date and the person that you're talking to has no interest in actually knowing you. They're only interested in you knowing them. And the biggest way that you can discover this, because people tell on themselves, I tell on myself, everybody does, it's by their words, they don't take a breath. They're so busy telling you about themselves and wondering if you're at all interested in them, that they don't even take a breath to ever ask a question to you. And then when you go to answer the question, right, they interrupt you with more information about them. Oh, there's worse than interruptions, too. There's one-ups. Well, you've done that. Well, I've done this. That's something men do. Let, let me tell you what, guys. <laughs> Ring ain't going on the finger. You act like that. It, it, it's not going far. But, you know, that's a, that's a, a little bit of a, of a test, isn't it? It's a test to know whether there's going to be any potential here for a relationship. Are you even at all curious about me? Or is this a, a one-man show and I'm just along for the ride? Right? I, I wonder if you approach God the way that you approach dates and the way that you've approached relationship and intimacy here on earth. How many of you know that... Uh, Information about the Holy Spirit is not intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, that's something you, ex you experience. Did you hear that? Yeah. You have to, it's caught, not taught. Because the point is, it's not just informational, it's intimacy. Intimacy is experience. You can't, I can't stand up here with a blackboard and start, you know, writing on a blackboard of, here's five steps to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. You're either willing to go there and be intimate with the Holy Spirit or you're not. And that means you want to know everything there is to know about him. Not just details about him, but you want to know of him. And you want to be in a relationship with him. 
So that means that your prayer life might look like this. It might look like long moments where you say nothing and listen to him talk. And, and, and you, you make sure there are no distractions because, you know, you're in love with this person. Just like you're in love with that first date, you know. Just like what you did on that first date hopefully landed you, fellas, to the altar where you're able to get married, right? And, and uh, j that's probably one of the best steps to stay in married is being interested in the person. Hello, right? If you're no longer interested, uh, none of this is going to make sense this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can have relationship with you, but I'm not going to be intimate with everybody. I'm going to be intimate with my wife. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? Um, I can have relationship with the Godhead, but I'm going to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to be intimate with everybody. Intimacy is something that is brought on by an experience of that relationship with Him. Here Paul walks into a church, they have no knowledge of the Holy Spirit, and we think as Americans, man, that church don't get it, right? But if somebody were to walk into our church, and if they were to ask you or ask me, hey, I'm here this morning because I was invited by somebody. Oh, really? Who were you invited by? I was invited by a person by the name of Holy Spirit. Well, come on in. You see, I'd like to know him better. I don't want to just know of him. I want to know him. Can you tell me where he is in your church? Can you introduce me to him? I want to be introduced to him. Now, let me talk to you about how introductions work. You see, you can't introduce somebody to somebody that you don't already know. <laughs> oh, sure, I can tell you all about him. You see, if you don't already know him, that's ignorance. If you think you can tell somebody just about them, that's information. Information don't work. Ignorance don't work. Intimacy does. You see, you've got to be able to say to somebody, hey, listen, not only do I know of him, I know him. I've been with him. I'd be happy to introduce you to someone that I know. Hello? That was the position they were in. And that's the position that most churches in our culture are today. Knowledge of the Holy Spirit, but do not know the Holy Spirit. And most of us, we would say, if I want to introduce somebody that wants to know the Holy Spirit, I'll just go find an elder or a deacon or I'll find a pastor and they'll introduce him. Right? That's not going to work. Paul goes into this church and he goes, hey, have you even heard of the Holy Do you have the, we don't even know who that is. And that's what I feel like the church, I feel like the church is the, in that place in America today. They don't even know who that is. Hmm. So there might be some assumptions. There might be some information that we might be able to make we might be able to say oh he convicts you oh he's the one that sanctifies you oh he's the one that reminds you of everything that jesus has taught oh yes he is the one that leads you to jesus and jesus leads you to the father oh yes he is the third part of the trinity but do you know him do you have you experienced anything with him have you can you talk of that experience with him you see i think most congregations if they were honest today would not be able to pass that date test the late great Catherine Kuhlman said this in her book gods and generals she said Christians today operate very little in the Holy Spirit because of their ignorance concerning knowing the Holy Spirit not the ignorance of the Holy Spirit their ignorance of knowing the Holy Spirit you see I wouldn't have a marriage for very long if I just knew of my wife and details of my wife, I have to actually know my wife. Now, what do we get in the church today? Here's what we get in the church today. Much of what was happening in Ephesus, in John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus helps us out with this. He says, that's because the world does not see him. So I don't see him. I can't tell you much about him because I don't see him. Or, Jesus says, know him. 
but you know him. He lives in you and he will be in you. Um, the relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit is so intimate that it's not a mano a mano. It's not a uh, be my <laughs> co-pilot. The relationship with the Holy Spirit is actually you become the church building and he lives in you. And that's how you know him. So let's talk about what that might look like, because there might be a couple caveats that we have. And I'm not so sure that those caveats and those those uh, those moments uh, that we say caveat emptor buyer beware aren't necessarily unbiblical. So as soon as I know the Holy Spirit in the way that pastor is talking about, I become this uncontrollable, wild, holy roller swinging from the chandeliers. There's a little scene in Blues Brothers where Jake and Elwood go to church. I know where that church is in Chicago. When I pastored in Chicago, it's still there. Okay, And they go to church and people are running up walls and they're doing backflips and triple flips and triple lundies, whatever, man. They're doing it all. And then there's this moment where Jake says, I've seen the light, I've seen the light. The band, Elwood, the band. And if you're under 40, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. But then suddenly, Jake and Elwood go on mission together because they have been in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The problem is, is in the movie, they never know the Holy Spirit. They never know the Spirit of God. Is it wild? Yeah. Is it weird? No. So if I get to know the Holy Spirit in the way that pastor's talking about, I need to become a complete weirdo. I will lose control of my being. I'm just going to, I, you know, I'm going to suddenly go on a run. I'm going to go on a run around the church 20 times. And then when anybody goes, hey, calm down, you might get yourself into cardiac arrest. I'm just going to say, nope, nope, nope. It's the Holy Spirit's fault. Now, if God tells you to go on a run and it's, blessing people and it's becoming fruitful cool but please don't put yourself in the hospital and blame the holy spirit i see that jesus was full of the holy spirit the bible says without measure and jesus didn't have to act weird he displayed the power of god on a regular basis on a daily basis and it, he didn't have to be weird I liken it to like certain types of cereals. Some Christians, they think knowing the Holy Spirit is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. That it's all about being a fruit loop. Craig, I'll preach what I want. You can call upon the name of the Lord anytime you want to as well. Yeah. So, oh, thank you. I vote a confidence from Craig. Yeah, cool. So, the Holy Spirit is not weird, but he is wild. He's wild. Jesus says when you encounter the Holy Spirit, he says this, he's like the wind. You have no idea which way the wind is going to blow next. And some of you are here today because the wind literally blew you into the sanctuary. It's windy out there today. You can't see the wind. You can't tell where it's going to go. It's unpredictable in nature. In other words, we shouldn't start to become perfunctory in our ministry together and think that everything should just be, it's going to be this way every time we get together because it's predictable. The Holy Spirit is not predictable. Let me tell you why he's not predictable. He's not predictable because he's God and his ways are not our ways. His ways are above our ways. So as soon as you start to think that you know what God's going to do next, let me just tell you, go ahead and check off the wrong box. Because if you want to be in this relationship with the Holy Spirit, you have literally no idea what he may call you to do next. I remember when James Johnston was with us. He's with the Lord now. But he had a testimony that I just absolutely loved. And for some of you, this is going to sound weird, but it wasn't weird for James. It was wild. Get this, he would get in his car because God told him to, and he'd start to drive. And then he would, he would just sense in his spirit, turn here, turn there, turn here. And he would land, 
he, the car would end up at a place, he'd put it in park, he'd get out of the car, he'd walk into a factory, there'd be three or four guys, and he immediately started talking to them about the Lord, and they'd have tears in their eyes. You have no idea what he's going to do next. Now, some of you are like, I, I'm not ready for that. I need a lot of control. Okay? I need a lot of control. Being led of the Spirit doesn't mean that you don't have self-control. Galatians chapter 5 says that self-control is the very last fruit of what the Holy Spirit produces in you. Paul says to the church in Corinth, and it's a corrective letter on when the Spirit moves. Did you catch that? Most of the theology we have in the New Testament on the Spirit moving is actually coming from a corrective letter where a church got out of control. And Paul says this. He says, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the... The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets. What is Paul saying? He's saying you can't blame the Holy Spirit for your weirdoness. That's what he's saying. Well, I just need to do, I don't know why I need to do this, but I need to, well, is it fruitful? Is it going to produce the fruit of the Spirit? Is it going to be peace? Is it going to be love? Is there going to be joy? Is there going to be self-control, patience displayed? Hello? Yeah. See, this is why most churches and most people don't want to develop this relationship with that kind of power, because A, on one side, they want to control the power, and you can't. <laughs> can, can I just say, we'll get back to B here in a second, but I, can I just tell you, the Holy Spirit spoke to me the other day, and he said, look at your dog, Kingston. And I did, I looked, and I was like, okay, yeah, Lord, what's up? He says, that's you. I was like, ah. Oh. I thought I was doing much better than Kingston. I told my wife this. I told my wife this. I said, God just told me that I'm Kingston. And I was like, am I crazy? She said, no, you're kind of Kingston. You know, she, <laughs> no, you didn't. No, she, 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 no, what she did tell me is that, come on, that's a, yeah. yeah. What she did tell me was, is that a preach? So I said, okay, why, Lord? Why am I, why am I Kingston? He said, because I can't open certain doors in your life without you running off. Oh, wow. You'll lack the self-control to be able to go places with me and you're praying for doors to be opened in your life that you lack the self-control to remain with me you'll go running out the door and get hit by a car oh, no. and i love you too much and that's why some doors are closed right. now it's easy for you to sit there and say well yeah 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 pastor i can see a few of those areas in your life And then the Lord said, you know what, sometimes when you walk Kingston, you know what would be great is if you walked with my spirit in such a way that I would not have to put you on a leash. I wish you would walk with me and not every little honking thing in your life becomes such a distraction. Like the next door neighbor's dog is a distraction. Kingston got in a fight with her. Yes, it's a female dog. Yesterday. Yeah. And all the dog did was come near the yard and Kingston's paws went through the fence and smacked her straight on the head. <laughs> and God says, you know what? You know what? To me, to me, to me. He says, you know what? I want, I want to walk with you without a leash. But that'll put a leash on you because if somebody comes and does that to you, you're going to react. If somebody comes and does this or that to you, you're going to react. And what I, what I want you to do is, is I want you to walk with me. I want you to walk in freedom. I want you to have, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. This, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. freedom. I want you to have freedom in your life, but you don't have freedom in your life because I cannot trust you outside of the closed doors and the fence and the leash. But if you could grow up and mature in me, we could go places, my son. Just think of where you'd be if you had the intimacy with the Holy Spirit. That's self-control. Yeah. Well, just think if you let the Holy Spirit produce that in you without having the Holy Spirit having to close doors and keep you a little bit confined because He can't trust you with the opportunities He gives you. I ain't playing. You're missing out on a lot. I'm your pastor. I'm flat out telling you. You're missing out on a lot. You at home this morning, you're missing out on all this. You say, you got no friends now. I got a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm good with him. I got an audience of one. 
Hi, I'm good with him. I'll say what he wants me to say. Now, on the other end, we want to control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, I'm not your pet. I'm not your animal. You don't put me on a leash. You don't, you, don't, you don't let me out of the box when you want me to do something to show my power in your life. I show my power in your life when I want to show my power in your life. Right. Now, on the other end, <laughs> we're afraid of what happens when it does happen. What are we going to do now? This is going to be wild. Yeah, that's, that's like anything that's living. If you grew up on a farm, you know about this. Do you want to have life in a church? Do you want to have life in your marriage? Do you want to have life in your home? Go see how it works on a farm. There's lots of life on a farm. And you know what happens when there's lots of life? It's poopy. It's poopy. I, I, got, I, I bought all my school clothes as a kid growing up, shoveling that into a manure spreader so that other things would grow. And you say, there's going to be a little bit of mess. It's okay. God's ready for that. God's can, God can handle that mess. Oh, no, 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 no. We need to be, we need to be Baptocostals. <laughs> you know, we need to be all tight and, you know. Oh, he, ha, that, I like that song a little bit. The Holy Spirit wants me to dance. And then we go into a Charlie Brown. <laughs> but I can't. Oh, that's wild. Uh, the Celts called walking with the Holy Spirit on God Glissa. Wild goose chase. You ever been on a wild goose chase? Yeah. You ever been on one of those like, uh, no, it's not like a snipe hunt. You ever been on one of those, you ever been on one of those where they sent you out to find certain things and What's that called? Scavenger hunt. Oh, a scavenger. You're brilliant. A scavenger hunt, right? And you had to go, you ever, you ever go out on one of those? It's like, there's no way we're going to find all this. And then it's like, hey, we got all this. Yeah. yeah. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what's happening next. All you've got, all you've got is the word of God, which gives you direction for what you're supposed to live into and gather and at the end of the day, at the end of the game, you're there. That's what I'm talking about. Real living, like adventurous living. Not the nine to five treadmill stuff that you're in. This rut and routine. Everything has to be uh, predictable and expectable. What if I told you that God has a grand, great adventure for you that will bust you out of the prison that you live in every day of your life? You think anybody in the last days of their life says, I wish I would have spent more time at the office and dies with their music in them? No, every single one of them says, Pastor, I wish I would have been on the adventure. I wish I would have taken just one more day engaging my family and trusting God for something more. Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit I'm talking about. Um, the Gauls attacked Rome. The Celts recalled their attack on Rome. As they went to attack Rome, there were flocks of geese that surrounded Rome. As soon as the Gauls showed up, the geese went, honk, 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 honk. <laughs> Any honkers in here? I did not say honky. Any honkers? It woke all the Roman troops up. They were able to ward off the attackers because of the geese. That's where they get the phrase. They get that kind of a phrase because you and I think the Holy Spirit is just a gentle dove. Let me introduce you to the Holy Spirit that is also a blazing, consuming fire. Let me introduce you also to the Holy Spirit who is also a rushing, mighty Ruah of God wind. Let me introduce you to the Holy Spirit who is also the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ that not only resurrected him from the dead, but resurrects you from the dead. Honk, 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 honk. You know, when your pastor starts acting like a goose, that ought to wake you up a little bit. I'm glad some of you are back with us. Congratulations. 
It's not either of those. It's not weird, but it's not tame either. It's wild. You won't be able to predict what God will do next, and that's the fun of it. That's the joy of it. That's the awesomeness of God because your life becomes a great adventure. As I start to wrap things up here, I want to talk to you about how the Holy Spirit is seeking a bride that binds itself to Jesus. This is the last part. But actually, everything I've taught and set up to this point pales in comparison to where the plane is about to land. This is very important. Okay. Back in Genesis chapter 24, Abraham starts to see that his son Isaac needs a wife. He sends his servant by the name of Eleazar to go and find a bride for Isaac. You remember Sunday school, the flannel graph? You're there. And as he goes out, he gives him camels, and these camels are laden with gifts, gold, blessings. Eleazar goes out with these camels, and he winds up at a well. At this well, he meets a woman by the name of Rebecca. Now let's backtrack for a second and let's go over the names. Abraham, Abba, means father. Ra, high father. Ham, nations. Abraham is the father. The son is Isaac, laughter, joy, he has already, with his father, climbed Mount Moriah, or today, Mount Zion, with the wood for the sacrifice. And climbing to the top of Mount Moriah, can you see him carrying that wood on his back? He gets there with the father and then says to the father, what's going on, dad? Where is the sacrifice? The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. They say to the servant at the bottom of the mountain, the boy and I will return. Abraham wasn't lying. Abraham fully knew that if God wanted him to offer a sacrifice of his son, that he could just the same God raise him back from the dead and they would return to the bottom of that mountain and see the servant again. Yep. The father climbs the mountain with the son. The son carries the wood for the sacrifice and becomes the sacrifice. Eleazar, his name means, <clears throat> I am God's servant. So we have the father, we have the son, and we have the servant. Jesus said, before he left, <laughs> I am going away, but it's better that I go away because one is going to come after me and I'm going to send him and he's going to be your helper. Same Greek word there is servant. Helper. Think about this. So we have the father, we have the son, and we have the helper, the servant. Back to the well. Eleazar ends up at that well runs into Rebekah. Her name means captivating, but a little bit deeper in the Hebrew, it means simply this. It means to be bound to. In other words, she was so beautiful that you were bound to her. But she was bound to you. God today is looking for a bride, the Father, who will be bound to His Son. Not play around with his son, not date his son, not, not say, I like you a little bit. I, wanna, I want you only when I have an emergency, son, but I want to have covenant with you, Jesus. I want to be married to you, Jesus. I'm married to Sarah, but I'm also married to Jesus. Three people come together at a wedding, not two. I'm in covenant with Christ. I'm married to him. You got to think of it that way. If you've been sold any other gospel, Cheap, blue light special, not the real thing. You're married to God if you're a believer in God. So, Rebecca 
now is confronted with the drawing power of the helper, the Holy Spirit. And the first thing he says to her is, give me a drink. Now, can I just tell you something? He's a guy. He's a guy. He could get himself a drink. Some of you ladies are like, if you're that hungry, get in the kitchen and come on. Come on. I get it. I get it. He's a guy. He could get himself a drink. What is he doing? He's giving her an opportunity to pass the test. It's a relational test. I don't know how much time I have. I got a little bit of time. There's a particular mobster movie. I won't give you the name. But there's a young man who's dating another young girl, and he wants to know from this wise guy, how do I know that she's the one? And he says, well, let me tell you, if you drive up in a car and you get out of the car and you come around to open the door and let her in and she sits down and then you close the door and you go to the other side of the car and that door is locked and she don't reach over and unlock the door for you, she ain't the one. You see, I want to tell you something. Your relationship with the Holy Spirit and God doesn't mean, that, uh, doesn't mean that you do the work that makes it all happen. It just means that you make yourself available to invite, to unlock the door, to come in, come in, come in, into your schedule, into your life. Get, you invite, this is all you do. You unlock the door and so, that, so that the Holy Spirit can come in. He requires an invitation. Eleazar wanted an invitation. And so he said, could you give me a drink? Jesus did the same thing, woman at the well. He could have went to the well and said, I'll get it myself. You're unclean anyways. And you got five different husbands. You ain't worthy to get me a drink. No, no, no. Jesus goes, no, no. I see your potential and I see your calling. Um, <clears throat> I tell another story. Yeah. I'm just a story man this morning. Don't you love a pastor? I got another story. I got another story. <laughs> there was this, uh, the, the neighborhood I grew up as a kid, we lived in a trailer park, and uh, there was a, uh, a trailer right next to ours, and they seemed to have everything. I mean, their kids had the big wheel before we, I did, the green machine before I did. They had all the cool bikes before I did. They got the Atari 2600 before I did. They had everything cool, right? They were rich, right? So every once in a while, they would ask my mom, They'd ask my mom for salt or for, for flour, and, and I, it, I would think, you know, and my parents and stuff say, what, what do they need from us, right? What do they need from us, you know? And it didn't, it didn't really strike me later till I, you know, kind of kind of exposed myself to relationships with people. They didn't need any salt or flour. You have no idea what that did for my poor family to be the ones to say, here, we have salt. You just don't know if you've never been in that situation. You, they were giving us an opportunity to give and to be just like them. And God says, I'm asking for a drink, and I'm asking for you to unlock the door and to come into your life, not because I need what it is you have, but because I want you to have an opportunity in this relationship so that you can feel like you're giving too. And that empowers you. It lifts you up. You don't have this poverty spirit anymore where God just is the only one giving. You get to give too. Eleazar says, please offer me some water. And she gives him water to drink from her pitcher. Oh, yeah. Straight from the church's fountain, man. And I needed it too, really. I feel like Aquaman up here, man. It's just, this is so good. And then, she don't stop there. Wait, there's more. She goes and starts watering the camels. Now, those camels drink about 10 gallons, 10 to 20 gallons of water a day. Where do you think the hump comes from? A lot of water drinking. He didn't ask her to do that. This, this way, we, a, a, a lot of things work, okay? You, 
<laughs> you can know of the Holy Spirit by saying yes to Jesus and allows, allowing Jesus to drink from your pitcher. All right? You can know of the Holy Spirit. But you get to know the Holy Spirit when you volunteer to water his camels. Would you like to know who his camels are? There's a whole honking, stinky room full of camels <laughs> in this room. Jesus said, out of your belly will flow wells of living water, water for the people around you. Yeah. For the people around you. Then once she did that and offered that of herself, guess what she got, man? She got the gifts. The problem is today we've had a few churches walk into revival a little bit with the gifts, but nobody's watering camels. And nobody's saying to God, listen, let me pour you a drink. God, here is my picture of my life. Here is my schedule. God, I just want to come into church on Sunday and see a bunch of people do the miraculous or experience the miraculous. But on Monday and on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, God, you're not in my picture or the picture. Pastor Glenn, you are insane. <laughs> Pastor Glenn, I, we just cleaned the carpets. We just did it before Easter. Now there's going to be a big honking line up there. Cool. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> We're looking for a God that pours out, but we don't want to pour out. There, <laughs> there's no room for God in my schedule. There's no room for God in my life. There's no room. I can't even be here when I need to be here. But I want the Holy Spirit. I want the power of God. I want the miraculous. Well, I'll just send in another prayer request. And those are fine. But if you listen to my message last week, God says that this church has to get beyond the prayer requests and into the intimacy of God where you're starting to see the miraculous things. What would happen if you got to a place with the Holy Spirit where you visited the sick and they recovered, and now you're coming in, not with a prayer request, but you're coming in with a praise report. And now your whole life has changed. Can somebody give God a little bit of praise? That's a big, ugly line. It's big. <clears throat> uh, as the worship team comes, I, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't hope to introduce you to someone I don't know, but I, I know him. I know him. I've been with him. It's given me the boldness to pour water all over this church. <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> I don't blame him. I'm just a little wild. Yeah, I'm a little wild. And you say, well, that's different, but maybe that's exactly what we need. Maybe the routine and the rut is religion. 